UC Riverside guard Zion Pullen is an excellent fit for Mark Few's team if Malachi Smith decides not to return to school. So let's learn more about the high-scoring veteran guard right here on the Locked on Zags podcast. Don't go away. You are Locked on Zags, your daily podcast on the Gonzaga Bulldogs. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network. Your team, every day. What is going on, y'all? Welcome to the Locked On Zags podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host and longtime Gonzaga podcaster, Andy Patton, here to give you news and updates on all things Zag athletics. Today's episode of Locked On Zags is brought to you by FanDuel Sportsbook, the official sportsbook of the Locked On Podcast Network. Make every moment more. Visit FanDuel.com slash Locked On today to get started. Well, we got a pair of transfers from the state of California to discuss as potential additions for the Gonzaga Bulldogs. We're also going to close out the show discussing Nigel Williams-Goss, who is a EuroLeague champion. Hear why it is such a special moment for Williams-Goss, especially after what happened to him last year. We'll get to that to close out the show, but we're starting things out talking about UC Riverside guard Zion Pullen, who is a graduate transfer, entered the portal shortly after the actual portal window closed for undergraduate students. Of course, grad transfers are eligible to enter the portal at any time, and Pullen chose to make that decision after a very, very solid four-year career at Riverside. He's a six-foot-four guard from Pleasant Hill, California, like we said, has spent his entire career up to this point at Riverside in the Big West. Has scored 12 or more points per game in each of the last three years. So it's not like he was a he was, he was a guy who emerged as a star or a star caliber player for Riverside in each of the last three seasons. So it's not shocking to see him be a guy who kind of looks for another opportunity to close out his career. Uh, but we mentioned 12 plus points per game in each of the last three years, but he really did have his best season as a senior this past year in the 2022-23 season. 29 games for him, 29 starts, played about 34 minutes per game. Uh, He averaged 18.3 points, four and a half boards, 4.2 assists, and just under one steal per game. Very efficient score as well, 50.3% on two pointers, 39.5% from deep. That is always the number you like to hear, right around that 40% when you're talking about guard additions for the Zags. Wasn't on a super high volume, 2.3 attempts per game, so he was... Did most of his scoring around the rim in the mid-range wasn't exactly a a lights-out three-point shooter in the sense he didn't take all that many, but he did hit them at a very efficient clip. was also about 77% from the free throw line as well. Had a couple notable performances. I always, when I'm looking at these mid-major guys, I always kind of like to look at how they did in their games against higher caliber opponents or the best teams they play in their league, or even if they do get a chance to play some of those power five opponents. Pullen looked very, very good in those games. He had 21 points, five boards, and three assists in a road loss at Oregon this past season. He also had 30 points and six boards on five of six shooting. This was against San Diego. Admittedly, not a great opponent, but still a WCC opponent. Uh, the Terreros were one of the worst in the entire country at defending a three-point line, so seeing Poland go five of six from deep in that game doesn't exactly shock me, let's put it that way. He also had 17 points and six boards, or excuse me, six assists in a road loss to a confusing but at times very good Colorado team last year as well. In terms of who's interested in Poland right now, we have not seen a list. Uh, he has been in the transfer portal for less than a week. One of the interesting aspects of him entering the portal at the time that he did, and for, for a handful of other players who've entered the portal very late, either right before the deadline or for these grad transfers who entered after the deadline, it always depends what you're looking for. Not every player is, of course, gunning for huge NIL bags, but teams are starting to probably have exhausted much of the money that they're going to give out. So I do wonder how much that changes the equation for guys like this of you know, not necessarily being able to go out and command the kind of dollar figure that maybe a player like this would otherwise command. It's something that we're not really privy to because we're not getting a lot of data on these NIL deals, but I am curious how much when you enter the portal and, and how much it impacts players who enter at this stage uh, of the offseason and how much that impacts them. 
In terms of teams that might be interested here, I'm going to quote from my good friend and colleague, friend of the program, Tristan Freeman, who wrote an article at Busting Brackets discussing some teams that he believes would be solid fits for pull in i will link the article in the show notes so you can read it and get some more insight than just a list of teams he did include gonzaga on that list alongside arizona and baylor florida illinois indiana kansas state louisville ole miss and ucla a very solid list of programs obviously a lot of high major highly talented sought after programs here uh, we don't know how many of these programs have actually reached out to Poland who have shown interest in him or not. Uh, UCLA stands out as a fairly obvious fit here locally. Uh, he wouldn't have to move very far to go join the Bruins. Mick Cronin's team is without Amari Bailey. They're without Jaime Jaquez. They're probably without Tiger Campbell. They're potentially without Jalen Clark. All those guys could be gone in the NBA draft process, and they haven't made a ton of additions. They have a solid incoming recruiting class coming in, but are they going to rely on a bunch of freshmen next year? They're not a bunch of blue chip five-star top 10 guys. In fact, I don't think any of them are even top 50 at 24-7 sports. Uh, so finding some more additions in the portal might be the way to go for Mick Cronin's team, especially if Campbell and Clark do not return to campus. If that ends up being the case, I could see a player like Poland being who they recruit and bring in to kind of help uh, be a one-year bridge, a one-year stop bat for them in the backcourt. Uh, I think Baylor makes a lot of sense as well, a team that lost Adam Flagler and LJ Cryer and Keontae George, their three-headed monster of guards. Two of those guys in the NBA draft, one of them transferred to Houston and LJ Cryer. They lost Dale Bonner, who was their fourth guard last year. He transferred to Ohio State. Uh, they've, again, they brought in some guys, Jaden Nunn from VCU is a nice transfer addition for them, but that's a team that I think needs some more help in the backcourt and Poland feels like a guy that would make a lot of sense for them. Indiana, somewhat similar situation. Jalen hood in the NBA draft. Tamar Bates transferred to Missouri, so they need a little bit more help in their backcourt as well. And that, All these programs stand out and make some sense in some capacity. Tristan's very good at his job. That is part of the reason why, but I do think that, that UCLA and Baylor stand out as some more obvious candidates, but there's an obvious fit at Gonzaga as well, and it really does depend on what happens with Malachi Smith. That has been the story of how we have talked about the transfer portal for the last few weeks. It's not going to change uh, at this point until we know whether Malachi Smith is returning or not. It is hard to know what that guard room looks like. If Malachi Smith's not coming back, the guard rotation is Ryan Nemhart and Nolan Hickman and Dusty Stromer at Steel Venters, depending whether you consider him a guard or more of a, a wing position there. Uh, that's kind of where you're at, adding another player in there who's comfortable playing off the ball, who isn't necessarily a ball dominant guard uh, who can play that role. And, and I think that's what Poland is. I think he actually looks a lot like Malachi Smith. Six foot four guard, decent sized, high level scorer at a mid major program. Smith averaged over 20 per game at Chattanooga. Poland averaged, you know, 18 a game at UC Riverside this past year. Uh, not necessarily a point guard type. Poland did play a lot of point guard in part because he was just the best player on his team. That was kind of similar to Malachi Smith as well. So I actually see a fair amount of similarities here. And I think if Poland were to be brought in to play that Malachi Smith role, he would be very, very good at it. Is that what he wants? Is that what he's looking for? Would he be comfortable coming into a situation where he didn't think he was going to start? Those are all the questions that you need to ask. You need to vet. You need to figure out how that works for those guys. Obviously, Malachi Smith was a player who, who came to Gonzaga. I don't know what he was told, obviously, but he came to Gonzaga and settled into a bench role for what may have been his final year of college basketball. We are still yet to find out. If Smith opts to return to Gonzaga, a player like Poland is probably not going to come to Spokane, and I wouldn't blame him for that. It would be difficult to come somewhere where – you know, you played 34 minutes a game last year, and I'm guessing that Poland's accepting that he's probably not going to play that much at UCLA or Baylor or any of these other programs, but you don't want to go somewhere where there's three other guards in front of you, or at least you have to compete heavily with three other guards for minutes in them, Harden, Hickman, and Smith. And if Smith's not there, Poland's going to play more than Dusty Stromer. He's, I don't know if he's going to play more than Steel Venters, but he's play a different role than Steel Venters at least, so I think it could make some sense. Uh, but again, until 
you know what's happening with Malachi Smith. I think it's a tough sell. I think the staff can sell him. Hey, we want, we view you like this. You could be a Malachi Smith type or an Admon Gilder type or a Jordan Matthews type, Byron Wesley type, you know, try to sell that archetype, which has been very successful in Spokane, but the playing time is just not as guaranteed as it was for those guys. And I think that's going to be the potential hiccup that would, that, that could prevent this from happening. But if it were to happen, I think it's a really nice fit uh, for Marfew and the Zags. Well, rim protection also remains a big need for the Bulldogs and San Jose, San Jose state center. Ibrahimo Diallo is a perfect fit for giving Gonzaga exactly what they need in the front court. More on him after a word from today's sponsor FanDuel. Grand slams, no hitters, and double plays are back, and there is no better place to get in on the MLB action than FanDuel, America's number one sports book. That's because right now, new customers can step up to the plate with a no-sweat first bet of up to $1,000. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on, sign up, place your first bet, and get up to $1,000 back in bonus bets if you do not win. Maybe you Zag fans want to bet on Marco Gonzalez to get a win for the Mariners. Perhaps you want to bet on Eli Morgan to get a save for the Cleveland Guardians. Either way, don't miss your chance to get a no-sweat first bet up to $1,000 when you join FanDuel today. Just go to FanDuel.com slash locked on to sign up. FanDuel, an official partner of Major League Baseball. All right, segment two, still any patents, still locked on Zags. And I want to thank all of you for making Locked On Zags your first listen or your first watch of the day. And remind you, everyday listeners, that we got more Transfer Portal coverage continuing to come on the show later. We got a couple of guests lined up to close out the week. Going to talk about Ryan Nemphart a little bit more in depth. Going to chat with a women's basketball player as well. All sorts of very fun stuff coming this week. So don't miss out. If you want to become an everyday listener, just make sure you are subscribed to the show wherever you get your podcasts and hit that subscribe button on YouTube as well. All right, we talked guard play in the front in the first part of the show. We talked about Zion Poland from UC Riverside, whether he could be a potential addition to Mark Few's backcourt. But now let's talk about the front court. We're sticking in the state of California with our transfer portal targets for today's show. And we're going to talk about former Ohio State and San Jose State Center Ibrahima Diallo, who I think fits a lot of what the Zags need or could potentially be looking for in a front court addition. He was a six foot ten center from Senegal. He is a also graduate transfer with, I believe, one year of eligibility remaining. It is a little bit unclear because while he's played four years of college basketball, two of them he played very, very little. So there is the possibility of a red shirt and potential additional eligibility there. I spent two years at Ohio State, the nineteen twenty season and the twenty 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 one season. Uh, but again, he played thirteen total games in those two seasons: eight in year one, five in year two, 50 total minutes in two seasons at Ohio State, 11 points and 19 rebounds. That is all we got from him while with the Buckeyes. He understandably entered the transfer portal, transferred to San Jose State for his last two seasons. His first year with the Spartans, he only played 13 games. Uh, He averaged seven and a half points, seven boards and one and a half blocks. So you could see the upside. You could see the appeal. You could see the reasoning for San Jose State adding him, but you just only got a little taste. You only got a little glimpse of what kind of player he could be at that level in the Mountain West. And then it finally all came together for him after three frustrating seasons of never playing more than 13 games in a year. Diallo finally got that opportunity last year during the 22-23 season. 35 games for the big fella, 35 starts, 17 and a half minutes per game. Average exactly six points, exactly six rebounds, and 1.7 blocks per game. He was an efficient scorer on from two-pointers, 59.1%. Not an outside shooter whatsoever. Also shot just 52.2% from the free throw line. So not exactly a player you're expecting to mature into an outside shooter uh, with that kind of production from the free throw line. Again, some solid performances and some bigger games. He had 10 points and four boards in 17 minutes on the road against the Hogs of Arkansas last year as well. It was a bit of a surprise to see him enter the portal. I know San Jose State fans were a little bit miffed to see him not coming back after kind of feeling like, hey, this is the first time we've really seen you be that guy, be that productive player, uh, kind of hoping that he would come back and give them another year of that, but he is not going to do so. He is out the door looking for another opportunity. And at this point, we have not seen a list 
of any sort on social media, on anywhere that I could find on the internet of programs that have reached out to Diallo or known connections that have been made at this point. That, of course, does not mean that those conversations have not happened. They almost certainly have. They just have not been published or publicized for whatever reason. Some pretty obvious candidates out there that could make some sense if he wants to stay in the Bay Area. Cal's made some additions to their front court, but Stanford could use some more help there. Maybe he even goes to another WCC school, goes to San Francisco. That would make a ton of sense if he really wanted to stay right in the area. Replace Zane Meeks, who transferred to Arizona State and was kind of one of the big options for Chris Gerlifson and the Dons last year. Uh, UCLA also makes some sense here. We mentioned them when talking about Poland, but uh, UCLA lost Mac Attini. He was their backup center. Maybe they need some more help in that front court, especially with the Dembona in the NBA draft process right now. Uh, Diallo is the guy that could go, go join the Bruins and, and be an option for them. Baylor, we already talked about them. They, they don't just need backcourt help. They need some frontcourt help as well. Flo Thamba is out of eligibility. They're starting center uh, from all the way back in that 2021 national championship game. Uh, he's out the door. They could probably use somebody who can protect the rim a little bit better than Caleb Lohner, who is not in any way, shape, or form a rim protector. Florida State, they lost Naheem McCloy. He hit the transfer portal and went to Syracuse. He was their shot blocker. Perhaps they could use somebody like Diallo to replace there. Uh, Utah Valley lost Aziz Bandego. He entered the transfer portal. We talked about him here on Locked on Zags, but he ultimately ended up going to Cincinnati and joining Wes Miller's team there. So Utah Valley is in need of a center. Maybe they could try to pivot here and see if they could land Diallo. Those are just some schools off the top of my head. Again, we haven't seen a list yet. Maybe a list will come out with none of those schools on it. Uh, maybe we'll we'll see some connections there potentially, but just some thoughts on some programs that could use a player like Diallo. What would he look like at Gonzaga? Well, again, just like we talked about with the backcourt and Malachi Smith, it depends on what happens with Anton Watson. Right now, I continue to be of the assumption that Anton Watson is going to return to Gonzaga for a fifth and final year of eligibility, but we have not heard anything. There has not been an announcement. So we're kind of still in a bit of a holding pattern. If Watson comes back, you have Anton Watson, you have Graham E.K., you have Ben Gregg. All of those guys are going to play, and all of them are going to play a lot of minutes. All of them have earned it. There's no reason that those guys won't each play as close to 25 minutes per game as possible. So what does that leave in terms of minutes in the front court? And what does that mean for Brayden Huff or Caden Perry? Or depending on what position they play, Alex Tui or Jun Suk Yo, I think they're more like threes. So maybe you don't necessarily need them to, to play power forward or, or center, but it still creates a bit of a log jam that I'm not sure how that would all shake out. But what I do know is that Gonzaga doesn't have a lot of rim protection on the roster. The only player who really has kind of ever been labeled a rim protector or has that kind of skill set in the bag is Caden Perry. And Perry's coming off of basically not having played college basketball for multiple years because of an injury. I hope he's healthy, sincerely, for his sake, of course, and for Gonzaga's sake. But I have a hard time imagining that he steps into a big ish role on this team next year. Maybe he does earn those fourth big minutes. Fourth big minutes haven't been tremendous in the last couple of years, just in terms of volume. It's part of the reason Efton Reed is not returning to Gonzaga. He was the fourth big and those, those minutes just didn't really materialize for him. So if Watson does return, is Diallo going to want to come into a situation where he's playing less than the 17 minutes per game he played last year at San Jose state? Hard to say. My gut says probably not. You never know what what is going to sell and, and entice and convince a player to come somewhere. I, if Watson were to not return, then I think the sales pitch on, on Diallo is a little bit better, a little bit smoother at least. You can say, hey, look, we have EK, we have Ben Gregg. These guys are going to play a lot of four. Uh, they're both really, really good offensive players. And we need somebody to come in and be a bit more of a defensive anchor. You know, you're not going to ask him to be a guy who gets a lot of touches around the rim. He's more of a rim runner, offensive rebounder. That's how he gets his points. But he's a, a stout defensive player who impact shots, block shots, uh, allows you to get out and transition, does all of that stuff. And I think he could fit at Gonzaga in a 15, 16, 18 minute role per game, just being a shot blocker and being a guy who scores four and a half points per game in 16 minutes, but he does all the stuff you really need him to do as a rebounder, as a rim protector. 
You don't necessarily have 16, 18 minutes per game for him right now, though. So that's the big question. Can you convince him to come to this program without knowing that he's going to have that big of a role? I think that's a little easier to do with developmental guys, whereas with a guy like Diallo, who's got one year of college basketball left, he may not want to use it going somewhere where there's not a guarantee of playing time. I don't blame him. Would you rather, I mean, for a lot of people, you could go to Gonzaga, you could make the NCAA tournament, you could have a chance to go to the Elite Eight, Final Four, whatever, or you could go to Utah Valley, for example, and start at center, replace Aziz Bandego. Maybe you don't go score 15 points a game, but you go play 25 minutes a night. Maybe you don't make the NCAA tournament, but maybe you do. Utah Valley might. Like, that's possible. So every player is different. They're always going to have different needs, wants, desires, whatever. It's impossible for us to know that without directly talking to said player or at least people familiar with the player. Uh, But I do think that there's an obvious fit at Gonzaga for a player with Diallo's skill set. Would he choose to bring those talents to Spokane in a yet-to-be-determined role? I probably wouldn't if I was him, if I'm being perfectly honest, but you never know. Perhaps the staff can try to will him using a Brandon Clark magic. Of course, Brandon Clark came from San Jose State to Gonzaga and then had one of the best single seasons uh, in Gonzaga basketball and college basketball history uh, for that Gonzaga team in 2018-2019. Diallo is not the same player. He's not going to have that same kind of impact, but who knows? Maybe the staff can show him a bunch of highlights of Brandon Clark as a Spartan and as a Zag and maybe convince him to come to Spokane for his, what I assume is his final year of college basketball eligibility. Well, Nigel Williams-Goss got his revenge after getting injured in last year's EuroLeague championship. He helped Real Madrid this year win the whole dang thing. More on his season and why this was so impactful for him coming up right after this. All right, closing out the show here on Locked on Zags, talking about former Gonzaga point guard and legend Nigel Williams-Goss because he's a champion. And for a guy who didn't quite get to be a champion in college and didn't quite get to be a champion last year in the EuroLeague, this is such a satisfying and fulfilling end to the EuroLeague season for Nigel Williams-Goss. Uh, Real Madrid beat Olympiacos 79-78 to to win the championship. Goss himself had nine points, two boards, and two assists in about 19 minutes of action. Uh, He didn't have his normal levels of production throughout the season at Real Madrid. He averaged about six and a half points per game, just under three assists and exactly two rebounds per game. He did shoot about 42% from deep, so he was a knockdown three-point shooter for Real Madrid and also shot 60% on two. Part of the reason for the, the decreased numbers is because he did not start the season healthy because last year during the championship game where Real Madrid did not win, Part of the reason was because very early in that game, Nigel Williams-Goss got stepped on by former NBA player Dante Exum. It was an accident, but Nigel Williams-Goss did not return to the game and in fact did not play again until November, missed the start of the next season with a serious ankle injury. He had to watch as his team got eliminated in the championship, got to come back this year, got to ease his way back into action, become a productive, significant part of Real Madrid's team, helped them into the playoffs and got to score nine points as they definitely took home a championship this time. No runners up for Nigel Williams-Goss. He was a runner up last year. He was a runner up in 2017. I'm sure he is happy as heck to have been the one holding the trophy at the end of the game. He had a really nice quote after the game that was in an article I read about the EuroLeague championship. He said, I told my teammates that I owed them one and obviously Sergio is the one who brought it home for us. That's Sergio Lowell. He's the one who hit the game winner with just a few seconds left. Williams-Goss continued, he said, but just to be out here and compete for my guys and to be a Euro League championship, or excuse me, to be a Euro League champion, it is unbelievable. I'm just so happy for Nigel Williams Goss, one of the easiest Gonzaga players to root for, a uh, incredibly kind, good hearted, intelligent, fun basketball player, just a, a great person, a great Zag, a great player to be the per i'm so happy he was the person who helped lead gonzaga to their first national championship appearance of course i wish that it had gone a different way as we all do uh, but for him to eventually get to hold that championship and a euro league championship i mean this is like as almost as good as it gets it's not an nba championship but that's about it that's about the only level that it's not quite capable of like the euro league is is second 
if you're talking like powerhouse basketball leagues in this in the world, I almost said country in the world, uh, you're talking NBA, you're talking Euro League, and then after that, you know, there's some high level basketball in China, there's some high level basketball in Germany, uh, Italian leagues, Russia, VTB is a very very prominent league, but it's NBA, it's Euro League, and then it's kind of everybody else. And for Williams Goss to be a big time contributor for the team that won it all in the Euro League just is a testament to how great of a basketball player he is and still is and and was of course throughout his Gonzaga career and and seeing him reach this threshold and this pinnacle is is a, a really nice moment that should be celebrated among Gonzaga fans. I think there's a larger conversation to be had about the inaccessibility of EuroLeague basketball that is changing. ESPN is going to start showing more EuroLeague basketball, which is a big deal, uh, a, a big impactful thing in terms of making basketball, worldwide basketball, more accessible to the American audience. And I think like, I think for Williams Goss, like this is just proof of, of, of how great these Gonzaga players do. And it's hard for us to be able to track all of them. We're going to do it more. On Lockdown Zags, for those of you who are not only everyday listeners, but longtime everyday listeners, you know that in the offseason, this is a, a project I like to take on a couple of times throughout the summer of trying to look back on old stats and figure out what's going on, not just with the big names, not just with Kevin Pangos and Kyle Wiltshire and Nigel williams Goss, but like what's going on with like Matisse Merninghoff? He's still playing, folks. He's playing in Germany. He played on the same team as Gino Crandall last year. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about Jeremy Jones and Jonathan Williams being teammates in China this past year. Like, I love being able to track our former Zags and where they're playing and what they're doing. Josh Perkins has had a fascinating professional basketball career, for example. So we're going to do more of that. We're still kind of in this portal NBA draft portion of the offseason. When we get through this, when we got a little bit more of some downtime, trust me, we're going to talk EuroLeague. We're going to talk about where these Zags are playing, what they're up to, what they're doing. Hopefully get some of them on the show to talk about uh, their experiences overseas as well, because I think it's something that Gonzaga fans love and crave and want. To, to learn what is going on with these players, but it's just not as easy as it should be to keep track of all of them. And I'm hoping I can help bring that to the audience uh, here on the Locked on Zags podcast. That is going to do it for me today, though. Thank you all for listening so much. Uh, it's fantastic to get an opportunity to talk to you guys about uh, as many different Gonzaga topics as I possibly can. Uh, we got more coming your way this week. We've got a couple interviews to close out the week. We'll talk about Malachi Smith and his situation with Gonzaga as well. All right here on the Locked On Zags podcast, available wherever you get your podcasts and available on YouTube as well. Go hit that subscribe button if you have not done so yet. Thank you all for listening. And as always, go Zags. <laughs>